Okay, final minute. Yeah, the link to the the link to the participation point is uh, points are the same, so they're always the same QR code and the same link that you can. Find. And yeah, you just enter in the secret word and you get participation for that week. And then in the last minute, uh, so. After going through this course, you get a good understanding of one second. I'll, I'll, I can share the link for the participation. What? One second. But yeah, after you take this course, uh, there, I recommend that uh, you look into something called the AWS Cloud Practitioner Certificate. Um, it's a pretty cool certificate that you can uh, get by taking like a quick SAT style test on Amazon Web Services. Uh, it's really good and you can put it on your resume and things like that. And uh, it's, it doesn't cost too much. It's like taking a, a uh, standardized test and you do have to renew it, but it looks good on your resume if you, um, if you wanna go for it. And I can provide some more info later if you guys are interested. Oh, gotta copy and paste the... Zoom link, copy link address. All right, there, I just pasted the participation form and uh, looks like it's 641. So we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Hi Vincent. Uh, this is our fifth lecture here uh, for cloud at California or slash the decal for cloud computing. So today we're gonna to be talking about databases, which is my favorite topic. And I love databases, it's used everywhere. So let's get started. So the agenda, today we have quiz four being released. I believe quiz two and three were due last week before the, on Friday, the 30th. So, those should be due. And then we're gonna re be releasing quiz four corresponding to this week's lecture on databases. And then we're gonna be doing a little introduction to databases, what kind of services and, or what is a database. So we're gonna be going into that. And then we also have a cool demo from Katan. He's gonna be demoing Amazon RDS or relational database service. That should be pretty cool. And then also uh, integrating that within AWS Lambda, which you might have remembered from our last demo last week. And then last but not least, our final topic for today would be uh, resource and data transferring. Um, it, it gets pretty wild at the end um, in terms of like how crazy some of the AWS services get. And um, I'm excited to kind of share what that means. But let's get started. Does anybody have any logistical questions so far before I continue? All righty. Sounds good, perfect. And then uh, just to mention, because I was talking about this briefly, for those of you who just came in, um, after taking this course, we recommend that you look into something called the AWS Cloud Practitioner Certificate. It's um, a really cool certification that you can get after learning about a lot of AWS services and how to apply them. It's like a standardized test that you can take. You have to pay a little fee, but um, it's cool to put on your resume and it shows that you're knowledgeable about the cloud and helps with internship opportunities and other stuff. So um, more information if you guys want to contact me or anybody else on the team about it, but let's continue. So relational databases. So for those of you who have not been in a database class such as CS186, uh, we're gonna get a brief overview of what a relational database is and how they work and why they are important. So, so in a relational database, you have something called a table. Um, I like to use the analogy of an Excel sheet uh, just to kind of contextualize some of these concepts. But if you were to think of a database and a table, a table within a database, it's similar to an Excel sheet 
within an Excel environment. Uh, you have the fields, which are the columns. You have the records, which are the individual rows of the columns. And then you have the schema. So that's just the, the titles, I guess you could say, for the individual columns themselves. And these are all the components that make up a traditional database. Now we'll get into why a relational database is a little different, but if you were to compare this to like something like an Excel sheet, you can kind of see right here, you have something along the lines of a row, which is a record. You have these columns, individual columns corresponding to fields, and then you have the schema. So in this case, the schema is a number and then some more strings. So good, good analogy always keep in mind that you can kind of compare them to Excel sheets, but that is a table and tables are within databases. And databases hold lots of tables. So what do tables need in order to kind of be a relational database per se? Well, tables need something called keys. Now keys are something that you use to identify individual tables and relate them with each other. And what I mean by that is, say you have two tables. One is a supplier table. It, this is like an example of like a business. You have supplier and then you have a product. Um, and then it, within this database for this business, you have these two tables. You can relate because suppliers and pr products are related in some way and you wanna be able to connect them. We use something called keys and there's two types of keys. Every table needs a primary key. So a primary key is the unique identifier for each individual record within that table. So in this case, the primary key for a supplier's table is a supplier ID or a unique identifier. So basically every row in this table has a unique ID associated with it. And that key is used to identify that specific row. That is a primary key because it is the unique identifier. Now, there's something called a foreign key. And this is where we start to get into the relational part of a database. A foreign key connects one table to another table through their primary key. So in this case, if I wanted to connect the products table with the supplier table, I wanna be able to do that through their keys. So we use something called a foreign key to connect it to the primary key of the supplier. So let me give you an example here. When you have a product, right? And you have a unique identifier for every product, you wanna know who created the product? Who's the supplier of that product? Well, you can set up a link or a relation, hence the relational database, uh, a relation to connect the product with the supplier. And then that's why we use something called a foreign key here. So you see here, 085 corresponds to this record or this row in the suppliers table. And now you have these unique connections between certain tables to kind of give you more information about the data. And this is used uh, particularly in a lot of businesses because you need to keep track of certain things and how they relate to each other. So let's say if I wanted to get the supplier for a certain product and I need that information, I don't wanna just store the supplier's name as an individual column here. That's kind of redundant and it takes a long time. You can actually just link it to the actual supplier itself through the foreign key. So yes, uh, remember that relational databases really emphasize on foreign and primary keys to set up the actual relations themselves. So yeah, uh, that's what I kind of touched on, but you can see in another example, you have, some, you have some dogs with their names and they can be related in a variety of different ways across tables. So you have a tag number in this table and then you want the dog corresponding to that tag number. You can have the foreign key, which corresponds to the primary key of the dogs. And then you have this cool, um, relation between these two tables. So in this case, let's say Fido, they like dry food and they're a good boy. Cool. 
Well, we want to get that information from the tag table because let's say we don't have the dog's name, but we have their tag number. Well, if you look here, tag number is right here and it, you can access the foreign key FIDO to get FIDO's other information, such as their dry wet food preferences and their good boy, uh, good boy Boolean. And then all, you can also add additional fields in the table as well. But that's just one example. And you see how in this case, we have a lot of different information that we want to categorize, but we don't want, don't want to put them all in one table. So in this case, we have a tag number, we have the breed, color, age. This kind of data is a little bit different from the dog's food preferences and whether they're a good boy. We don't want to put them all together so we can separate them, yet connect them through their keys. And we can set up these cool relations. And then additionally, um, a primary key can also be the primary key of another table. So meaning the foreign key slash primary key in this is ambiguous because now it is the reference for two tables. So you have the height for this specific tag number and that tag number corresponds to this row, which corresponds to Fido, who likes dry food and is a good boy. A lot of information and you don't want to keep it all in one table. Yes. So does that block table have yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't I don't know too much about the technicalities of it, but I believe in this situation, this is a primary key right here, the tag number, and a name is a foreign key. Uh, and then this also is technically a foreign key as well because it's referencing another primary key in this table. So yeah, I I, I think I would agree with that. But um, if anybody um, thinks different, uh, please let me know and we can kind of go back to that. All righty. So now we have relations. So we saw in this case, we have a link between this table to this table to this table. Now, what? how do we describe those kinds of relations? And how do we know that one table only connects to one other table, whereas this table connects to two tables? But what's the terminology we use to describe that? Well, we have something called relations. Um, we have many-to-many -many re relations. So what I mean by that is many-to-many -many means you have a key that relates to more than one table. Um, I'll get into the different types, but uh, this example isn't very clear on what that means. So let me go through this. Uh, let's start out with one-to-one, -one, and I'll go back to many-to-many -to, -many to make that more sense to make them seem more sense. But a one-to-one -one relationship is basically a table that connects to another table and that table only connects to this table. So it's a one unique constraint between two tables and they're connected uh, two ways, yet they're the only two tables that are connected. So what I mean by that is, let's say you had a student's table and you kept, ta kept track of their uh, full name and then you want to keep track of their city and phone number as well in another table. And these were the only two tables that related to each other in this sense. This is a one-to-one -one relationship. So one meaning students corresponds with students. And then this table isn't referenced anywhere else. And this table doesn't have any other references because they have no foreign keys. And then we have a one-to-many relationship. This one is a little bit more intuitive. When you think of one-to-many, you can kind of just think of one person having connections to a lot of different things. So in this case, we have a person who's connected to an orders table, but they have a lot of different orders. So therefore it's a one-to-many relationship. So they have connections to many individual table or many individual records within that table. So in this case, a one-to-many relationship in a customer's slash rewards scenario is there's one customer and they might have many uh, orders. So this is a one-to-many. And then in reverse, this would be a many-to-one relationship. And then many-to-many uh, this diagram isn't um, clear, but many to many is when you have one table that connects to uh, many other tables 
And then that other table connects to many other tables. But I can clarify uh, to come back to it. So now we're going to be starting to do something within SQL. So if you don't know what SQL is or haven't taken a database course or a query course or anything like that, SQL is, stands for Structured Query Language. It's a tool that you use to pull or insert data from a database. So uh, we're going to get into some basics within SQL. Let me click on this link here. Uh, and then I'll do like a side-by-side -side demo as we go through this. But uh, SQL, right, we have a lot of tables within our database and we want to pull information out within those tables. We need to write SQL queries, SQL queries, or AKA commands or methods that pull data from those tables. So uh, to give, we're not going to go too far in depth in it because it's not so useful as of right now. Um, in purpose, you get more in depth with it in like a little bit higher division courses. But uh, this is a command called select. Select just means you're taking certain columns from a table. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's say we had a customer's table. We have a customer table. Let me visualize that for you. Uh, one second. Where did I just click the link? Excuse me. Okay, boom. Okay, so this is our customer's table. We have like a customer ID, a customer name, a contact name, address, city, what's it called, and then country. This is like pretty real data. And you can kind of, this is all fake, but this is like what you would see in like a database setting in like a corporation where you have users or like customers. So yeah, they have a unique ID. Their primary key is the customer ID. And they, they have all this schema right here to describe that individual record. So we have some guy named Alfred, and then he has all these attributes corresponding to his, his name. So we have this command right here, select star from customers. What does that mean? That just means, I'm so bad at this. I need to work on my Mac commands, but uh, excuse me, guys. Uh, so that means you're just getting every, the star means you're getting every single column from a customer table. So in this case, when we say select star from customers, that means we're just getting every single column from that customer's table. So this is the table right here, select from customers, basically just returns the table itself. So if I run the command, that gives me the table itself. So yeah, select returning um, something from a table, also known as the columns. And then from is what table you're pulling from. So in this case, it's the customer's table. To, so intuitively, that makes kind of sense if you were to read it and uh, think of the semantics of it. Um, you're selecting star, which means all. You're selecting all columns from customers, from the customer's table. So it's a very simple command um, that will get you kind of introduced to the idea of SQL queries or SQL methods commands to pull data from a table. Alrighty, so we're going we're gonna to start getting a little bit more complex, um, but I'll walk you through it. This is select. Remember, these are uh, column names or field names within that table. We're going to select the customer name and the contact name from the customer's table. So what that means is we're going to write that here. So you see there's a customer name field here and a contact name here. We can write that same statement, excuse me, I'm gonna put my mic down. Uh, we're gonna write customer name. You can separate columns by uh, commas, by the way, but if you were to run this command, it just returns you the customer name and the contact name from the table. Very simple, um, really cool way to just see certain aspects of your data, such as um, certain fields. So that's a simple command that you can use. Next, we want to talk about something called the where clause. So you have 
a condition where you're saying, I want to select these, uh, these columns from this table. But let's say you want to kind of filter out the records within that database or within that table. This is where the where clause uh, comes into play. So in this example, let's say we want to see all the customers. We want to select star from customers. We want to see all the customers, but we only want the country, uh, the customer's country to be from Mexico, but not in Berlin. Excuse me, did I read that statement wrong? But not Berlin and all the... Yeah, so we wanted to get all the customers where their country of origin is Germany and not from a city within Berlin or Münster. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. This is a little bit more complex. We're saying we want every single customer from Germany, but we only want them to not be from Berlin or this city. Um, I, I won't write the query out for the sake of, I don't have special key, key uh, replacements for this letter right here, so I can't execute the command as quickly. But what you would expect is, it's gonna give you every single customer from Germany that satisfies this constraint right here, where they're not from Berlin or um, Munster. So that's the, what the where clause does. The where filters out what you've gotten from your table. And then a little bit more complex is something called a join. So this is a whole nother um, thing to talk about because they're kind of complicated to understand at first. But basically, let's say we want to join two tables uh, where a certain field matches. So like some kind of relation exists between those two tables. So like if there was a field in one table and then a field in another table and they were the same field, that's like a way of relating those two tables. You can actually join those two tables on that field. So what that means is uh, if we wanted to collect data about an order's ID and the customer's ID, but we don't have the order ID and the customer name within the same table, we can perform a joint. And that is done through something called the inner joint. Uh, inner is just a, a certain type of joint that we won't get into, but if you look at the graph, that's what it means. You're collecting the same uh, values from both tables. But yeah, this statement right here is saying, we're gonna join the customer's table, combine the customer's table with the orders table on a certain field, the field being customer ID. And this is where they're equal. So I can actually demo this to show you kind of what I mean. So right here we have the customers table and then we wanna join it on, I believe the customer ID. So, so here you can kind of see customers table, you have the customer ID, all the metadata, and then you have an order. And with it, with each order, a customer ID is associated with that order. So hence, there's a relationship between those two tables. That means customer ID corresponding to 90, that customer placed this order. So I want to join this table and that table to see who placed this order. So let's write that up. So I'm going to put the mic down. OK. So we're going to select customer, uh, what was the statement again? We have customer ID and orders ID. So customer name, okay. We're going to select customers dot customer name. And then the order ID from, there's a notation or when you're writing these select statements, there's a bit of a syntax notation where if you're selecting um, a certain field from a certain table, you have to use a dot to kind of access that field. So that's what this means. We write from orders. This is the orders table. Uh, joined with, we can write inner join as well, but it's not too important. Inner join with 
uh, inner join, uh, it was the customers table, customers on. So I didn't talk about this, but on is just basically the field that you want to do the joins on. It's the field that connects those two tables. So since we know that customer ID is uh, connecting these two tables and customer ID right here is the foreign key to the customer's table's primary key, we can do a join on that. So we can do orders dot customer ID. Yes, customer ID equals customers dot customer ID. And hopefully this goes through correctly. Yes, it does. So now we successfully joined two different tables based on their relation. So now you know that for this order, this person named Wilman Kala placed that. So cool, we just made some complex connections between two different objects without having to store all of their fields in one table. We stored them in two, and then now we just combine them. That's what makes this kind of relational database so effective is we can organize our data and then connect them, pull data from the connections and voila, we have a really nice way to look at everything all at once. Okay, that is what inner joins is. Cool. So anybody have any questions about that? Because that's a bit complicated. Yes. Good question. So uh, the question was, is there a difference between the order in which we write this from statement? Because right here we wrote orders inner join customers. Could we also write customers inner join orders? Absolutely. Because uh, the order does not matter because at the end you're essentially combining those two and returning uh, certain fields from those two tables. Uh, that's why we need to specify which customer ID field using this syntax right here. So uh, let's say we had in the, in both cases, if you wrote customers first and orders last, it would still be the same. But in some cases, edge cases, you need to really specify certain fields that are only particular to one table, but not the other. So in this case, we want to specify it's the customer ID from the orders table that equals the customer ID from the customers table. Because if you didn't write the dot and the dot here, it wouldn't know what you're talking about. It's a bit ambiguous because there's customer IDs in both tables. But yeah, to answer your question, um, simply yes, the order does not matter in which you do a joins. Any more questions? Cool. So that was talking about relational databases. So relational databases, they're the more traditional one. They were developed first and they are used throughout the industry because by nature, when you have lots of data, they're connected in one way or another. So that is why relational databases are so commonly used and they're still somewhat the industry standard today. But recently, not so much recently, but it emerged a new technology called non-relational databases. So we'll get into what that means. But when you're performing a lot of queries on relational databases, there are kind of few downsides to that because you have a lot of different relations. And then if you're pulling data from uh, tables that have relations with each other, there are a lot of uh, slow run times in doing so when you're querying because you're going through a whole uh, table on this call or in this row, or sorry, excuse me, you're going through a whole table and then you're selecting this from this row, but you need to connect it to that row. You're going through a lot of scans. You're going through a lot of records to do those operations. And especially like I mentioned in the where statement um, right here, the where statement, when you're using a where statement, it's a filter, right? You only apply, to, you only apply a filter when you do a scan of every single row in that table because you want to check every single row and see whether it satisfies this constraint. That's a lot of runtime. So this is where non-relational databases come into play and why they're so effective in certain cases. 
So this is a structure of something called a NoSQL database. Uh, NoSQL, so relation databases are usually um, represented as SQL databases, and then non-relational are called NoSQL databases. In this architecture, uh, the databases aren't represented by uh, traditional means. They have something called collections, which are comparable to tables. Uh, they have documents, which correspond to like a certain row within a table. And then they have key value pairs, pairs which are like individual field mappings to the value. Uh, so if you look at this diagram right here, you can see that this is nowhere close to what a relational database looks like. Now you have a row that's represented on the left or the rows represented in these documents. And then the tables are the collection of all these random rows. Like it doesn't really make sense when you look at it. But if you can kind of turn your head or kind of look at it from a horizontal vertical standpoint, you can kind of see like the fields right here would correspond to the fields in a um, relational database. And then these are the values for those fields. And then this whole section is a record. And then that would be the table, which is a collection. It's a weird architecture and you'll see why it's important. I'll get into that. So yeah, this is what it looks like. So what is the difference? What is the prime difference between non-relational and relational databases? Well, remember how I said, when you perform a lot of scans on uh, relational databases, you're taking a really long time to gather certain information. Well, that's what makes NoSQL so uh, effective. You can access information very, very quickly. So NoSQL is better for storing huge amounts of data because you don't have schema. Every individual, uh, document has different structures and uh, different fields within them. And you access every uh, document through their primary key. So what I mean by that is um, traditionally in relational databases, when you're trying to access certain data and you need to do conditions on getting like a user's order, that's a lot of scans. But in this model, you have individual documents where their primary key is the user itself. So you can access all of the user's orders through just one statement or one method in a NoSQL database. So it's very flexible and there's typically no relations. It's kind of hard to understand what that means. Like how can we have no relations in a lot of tables? Well, there's certain use cases where we're, we will get into that kind of allows you to contextualize this but you should know that they're very flexible. Another important thing that I'm gonna get into is uh, the different scalability of these two types of databases. So uh, when you have traditional relational databases, they're stored in hard drives or they're stored in database servers and there's stuff going on in the back end that kind of uh, optimizes the way data is retrieved. But in non-relational, uh, in relational databases, since all the tables are related in some way or another, it's very hard to distribute individual data across different machines. And then that makes uh, NoSQL a perfect counterpart to that. Because when you have a SQL database, it's very hard to scale up. You don't have as much freedom to buy more machines to accommodate more data. In NoSQL, you can do that because it's relationship less. You can store some amount of collections here in this machine, some allowed uh, amount of collections in this machine. They don't have to relate with each other, yet you can access them from any machine. Whereas SQL, it's more complicated because when you're doing queries and the data is split, you're now taking queries that grab data from this machine and does all the scans there and then has to go to this machine, do all the scans there and this one and et cetera. No SQL is perfect for just going through once and just scanning and getting everything. And it's very cost-effective in that manner. And it's really good for uh, really rapid data access. So yeah, instead of relations, you just include all of the data within the collections. And it results in very fast, quick.
queries because you're just pulling uh, you're pulling documents based on primary keys. It's a lot of reads. Um, that's why uh, NoSQL is very important in that manner. You can read a lot of data at once, but writing is a little bit more complicated. So horizontal scaling is the idea of distributing data across multiple uh, hardware. Okay, so we have these distinguishing factors. Let's uh, contextualize that. What is the what is the difference between the, these two, and why do they matter? So here's some use cases. Let's say you're building a small scale project involving budgeting, and you want to keep track of all your recent purchases. Let's say I'm like, I have five hundred dollars, and I really want to make sure I keep track of how much I'm spending this month. Uh, I want to store that information in a database. So like I want to store every purchase I've ever made, um, put it in the database and keep track of it. Like what database should I use? Should I use a NoSQL database? Should I use a SQL database? Um, which one? Well, in this case, I'll get into it, but SQL and NoSQL are suitable for this situation. Um, on certain circumstances. So let's say you just wanted to keep track of every purchase, but you don't care about where they came from or whatever. You just wanna have a list of all your purchases and be able to like kind of sum them up and things like that. NoSQL would be, would be perfect because every individual purchase has nothing to do with each other, right? You're just listing out every single purchase you made within the past month. Now, this becomes a little different. Let's say you wanna keep track of every purchase but you wanna keep track of which store that purchase came from. Now you want another table to kind of make information more relational. So now like, let's say I ordered a burger from Burger King, instead of just storing purchase this amount a burger from Burger King and just putting that as one record in one table, I can have two tables, Burger King being in the store table and then purchase being in the purchase table, and you have a connection between those two, you would use a SQL database to kind of represent that and to kind of connect those two things. Now you can categorize your purchases based on where they came from, and then you can categorize uh, the purchase itself. So that's one use case of SQL database. But if you don't care about any of that and you just want the purchases, then NoSQL would be that uh, perfect scenario. Next, we have another example. Let's say you wanted to create a database for UC Berkeley, like all of UC Berkeley students, all the courses, all the departments. That's a lot of categories and a lot of different connections, right? You have students from different majors studying in different departments, taking certain courses, and certain courses belong to certain departments. And then, you know, you want to keep track of all these different connections. This is pretty intuitive, but you would use a SQL database because you can keep track of all those relations. Let's say you wanted to get all the students from this, you want to sum up all the students from, let's say, uh, CS188 or the decal, for example, in the engineering department. You can do that in SQL, but you can't really do that in NoSQL. Let's say you're developing a Twitter-like application where users can access their tweets almost instantaneously. So you have, you posted a bunch of tweets and now you wanna access all your tweets like really quickly. Um, intuitively, we know that we only wanna keep track of the tweets and we don't care about whatever connection the tweets have with anything else. We just want the tweets themselves. This would be a NoSQL scenario because now you just get, every single tweet that corresponds to the uh, primary key of your, let's say user ID. And it's very quick. Um, that's why NoSQL is perfect for lots of data, such as lots of tweets in a day. There's like millions of tweets every day. We can have NoSQL database that pulls all of them all at once. And uh, Twitter actually uses NoSQL databases to accomplish this. And then now let's say you have lots of money and you're growing your company very quickly. This is kind of like, what does that mean? Like it's not, it's not very intuitive what that means. Well, you want to be able to scale up very quickly if your company's growing very fast. 
Therefore, you want to be able to have a database that you can uh, use to grow with that. So a NoSQL database, remember, it's very scalable. You can horizontally scale, meaning you can just get more machines to do a lot of more work and distribute access. This is why you would use a NoSQL database. Um, SQL, yes, you can buy a very large database and have a lot of computational power to do those operations, but it's very hard to scale once you already bought what you have. Whereas NoSQL, you can just keep tacking on and then um, all the work gets distributed across those different servers. Are there any questions from these examples? Alrighty, perfect. Let's try some let's try some queries based on uh, that little demo we had earlier. So, what if we wanted to select the contact name and address for customers uh, from Mexico? So, going back to this little area, we want to get the customers from Mexico, and we want to select their address and contact name. So, let's go to the customers table. We see the customer name and we see the address. Um, I, you probably already know what you would do, but in this instance, I'll just write it out. You can have the customer name, address from, and then uh, in SQL syntax, it's usually uh, professional to write the actual clauses, the predicates of the clauses in all caps, but yeah. Um, not too important from customers table. This just gives you the customer and then the address. Pretty nice, pretty simple. So that is, oh yeah, I forgot, <laughs> totally forgot the uh, the statement right there, spoiler, but where uh, country uh, equals, and then since Mexico is stored as a string, you can just make it equal to a string. And then, yeah, these are the only five customers that are from Mexico. And here are their corresponding customer names and their addresses. So pretty cool. Nice filtering going on there. You can see why it's a little bit uh, inefficient running a giant query. If you have a lot of customers and you're only trying to get the ones from Mexico, you still have to go through every customer to check to see if they're from Mexico. So that's where a lot of IO costs um, kind of negatively impact your performance. So here are the same tables, or here are the same table and the corresponding schema. Okay, so for each order, we wanna select the order date and the phone number of the shipper who's shipping it. What, what does that even mean? Like, that's a lot of connection and like, where do we even start? How do we even build this query? Here's a hint. We, we know that there's a shipper table. If you didn't know, there's a, shippers table. And then we want an order for, or uh, there's an orders table, right? Because we weren't, we're trying to get every order. And we see here, there's a shipper ID and we check the shipper table and then there's a shipper ID. That's a perfect use case for a joins. We can jo join two tables and then get the order date and phone number of the shipper who's shipping it. That's cool. So hint number one, we're probably going to have to use a joins to get those two tables. Number two, hint number two, uh, we have these two commands that get all the columns from these two tables. Well, if we only want certain columns from these two tables, we would have to modify the star to represent which we want, which tables, uh, which columns you want. So let's go back to this. We want the order date and the phone number of the shipper who's shipping it, phone number corresponds to the shipper, yet order date corresponds to order. So that's, we're selecting different fields from different tables. So we see right here in the orders table, we have the order dates and the shipper table, we have the shipper phone number. So let's write that query. Uh, a really great tip is actually, um, starting from the from clause and then working your way up. So what I mean by that is right here, let me look at the schema phone, okay. So we, we can actually do something where we first start by writing the from. So when you think about writing SQL queries, you wanna start with where you're trying to get the data and then what do you wanna do with the data 
And then what do you want to select from the data? That's kind of the thought process you should be thinking about this. So in this case, we want from order, from orders table, join, inner join, sorry. You can write this in different lines too to make it look clean. Inner join, whoops. And then remember, uh, order does not matter. Good question before, but we can do this the other way around, but we can have the shippers, uh, shippers, where, because we wanna do a where statement and we know that shipper ID is in both tables, we do orders dot shipper, shipper ID equals shippers dot shipper ID. And then what tables do we want? We want the orders, uh, what was it, order date? And then we want the shippers phone. So this should work, boom, okay, it did. Thank God, that would have been embarrassing. But we have orders and each order's order date corresponding to the phone number. Am I missing? Oh, for each order. So we should also add, we can, we can just assume that uh, at the beginning you have the order number. I didn't write that part, but you can write select order UID. But yeah, that would be um, a situation in which you would wanna perform a joins and do that with relational tables. Cool. So yeah, you have the order date, shipper's phone. You wanna join on this key right here. Pretty complex, but pretty, pretty intuitive. And you can kind of see the thought process. You wanna start from where you wanna grab the table, join those tables, filter out those tables, and then select something from those tables. All right, let's see. I believe there was supposed to be. Yeah, you have a question, sorry. Yeah. A good question. So uh, going back to this, we said, uh, he's sorry, what was your name? Rahib? Raghav. Raghav. Okay, good question. Uh, Raghav asked, uh, what's the difference between where and on? Well, where is used to filter out one table, right? We want a table and we want to filter out by a country. And then on is the condition or slash the relation that we want to join two tables on. So we want to connect the orders and the shippers table by their shipper ID, but it doesn't do any filtering. We're just joining them on that connection. And then where you can use to filter out that uh, joint table. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, I use where. Let's see, did I use where? Uh, oh yeah, I did. Good catch, sorry, this should have been on brain fart. I believe, it, okay, in this case it didn't, I'm not sure why, but- um, I, can, I can jump in on this one. So basically the way the, on works here is very similar to the way the uh, where command works within SQL. When you're using a where in your SQL query, uh, what you're really looking for is you're trying to see if uh, two things are equal. And if they are equal, then it's actually going to be returned in the result. And if they're not equal, then it's going to be excluded from the result. So in the case where uh, we were using where for uh, filtering out based on country, we did where country equals Mexico. So what it does is it's going to look at the value that the record has in the country uh, field. And it's gonna check if the value there is equal to Mexico. And if it is equal to Mexico, then it's going to include it in the result. Uh, otherwise it's going to exclude it from the result. And if we go to the join, um, 
again, what we're doing is we're comparing two things. We're comparing the orders.shipper ID and the shippers.shipper ID. So in that case, uh, when you substitute a where instead of the on, uh, it's going to do a similar thing where it's going to check if uh, those two things are equal. If they are equal, then it's going to include it within the result. And if they're not equal, then it's going to exclude it from the result. Now, um, the typical syntax when we're using a join is to use the on, but um, a lot of times you can get away with the where because the purpose behind these two mechanisms is very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason why they return the same result is actually because every single order has a shipper ID. Um, if, if there was a case in which an order didn't have a shipper ID, it would not be included in this result because of the where statement, like if we wrote the where, um, because it would check to see if null equals a shipper ID, and in which that case, it will never return yes, so it would never be returned. But yeah, in this case, it works the same way. Yeah, good question, though. That, that was really good. Good catch, too. All right. Uh, was there a, I believe there was supposed to be a um, break slide right here. No, wait. Okay, okay, sorry. I'm getting a hold of myself, uh, going ahead of myself, but all right, one more section and then we will take a break and then a quick demo. But we're gonna be talking about some applications. So some database services within AWS. So in the AWS ecosystem, there's databases that support different kinds of use cases and uh, there's different purposes. Uh, there's six major kinds of AWS services slash database, databases that are used uh, commonly from Amazon. We have something called RDS, which is Relational Database Service. We have something called Amazon Aurora, DynamoDB, DocumentDB, ElastiCache, and Neptune. You might have heard some of these, uh, maybe not, but they're pretty commonly used and we'll get into them. So uh, you can just think of these as relational databases, databases, or, um, or services corresponding to databases. Um, and we'll get into which ones are which. So uh, Amazon Relational Database or Amazon RDS, this is a relational database service. Um, you can kind of uh, in interpret that from this uh, bullet right here. It's not a database, but it's a, more of a service that manages databases. But yeah, so it has SQL compatibility. So it supports a lot of databases or database engines. So these right here, these, these examples, PostgreSQL, um, MySQL, Oracle, MariaDB, Microsoft SQL, these are all different databases that are uh, offered as services by these big companies. Um, Oracle is probably the biggest database provider uh, in the world. They were the industry leading standard with their uh, Oracle database. Yeah, these are all databases. So uh, they correspond to different use cases, which we'll get into, but um, just know that these themselves are databases and RDS can incorporate these databases slash support them slash manage them. And then a uh, really big plus side of why we use Amazon RDS is because it offers really high availability and fault tolerance with um, multi AZ, deployment, availability zone deployment. So that means uh, your relational database, if you were to store, excuse me, not just relational, non-relational as well, but if you had a database and you stored it within RDS and managed it with RDS, that database is actually um, able to be deployed in multiple availability zones. So it takes advantage of that edge location kind of thing we were talking about in week one through two. And then there's also automated software maintenance and the ability to read, uh, launch read replicas across regions. Read replicas are like copies of your database. So when someone's trying to uh, query from your database, it doesn't have to go to the database itself. It can go to a replica and that uh, decreases latency. So you have really high access rates. So uh, an example of when you could use RDS, you could use 
an Oracle database or a MySQL database that can store records of Berkeley students. So a big table, and that's a good use case for RDS. Um, yeah, so to, to not get it confused with a relational database service, um, RDS is not a database itself. It's a one, it's a service that allows you to create databases and you can create these databases, for example. Alrighty, so that's RDS. We have something called Amazon Aurora. Aurora is an example of one of the databases you can create within RDS. So it's, it's not uh, similar to RDS in that sense. But yeah, Aurora is a relational database that is uh, compatible with MySQL or PostgreSQL. Uh, those are two databases. Aurora is really unique in the sense that it actually has a lot more optimization going on within its engine. Uh, in a relational database, uh, there's a lot of indexing slash uh, recovery slash like uh, optimization that's going on when you're writing queries that involve a lot of joins, for example, you know, when you're joining a lot of different data, there's ways to optimize that. Aurora takes advantage of that and figures out the best possible optimizations and it yields um, even faster query results than standard SQL or SQL uh, relational databases. And this is managed by relational database service and scales automatically so you don't have to worry about any of the hard work. So yeah, or remember Aurora is a relational database that you can create within uh, Amazon RDS. And an example of when you would use this, let's say Walmart wanted to have an inventory database and they wanna collect and access data very, very quickly. Well, you can take advantage of the five times faster than standard SQL databases this fact, you can take advantage of that and use an Amazon Aurora database. So yeah, Aurora, really good for access and speeds in querying. There's a lot of other additional benefits and it's used in RDS and is an Amazon product. Cool, so Aurora is a big one, right? Uh, DynamoDB, you actually might've heard this one. DynamoDB is another really great database service. Oh, uh, question here. Yeah, so when you're uh, deploying in the cloud, you don't have to worry about the hardware. And let's say Aurora gets a lot of data and there's a lot of access that needs to be required on that data. Um, Amazon kind of, I don't know how they do it, but their scalability grows with the amount of data that needs to be accessed. So uh, for example, if you need more computational power because there's a, because there's a lots of uh, accesses going on at once, uh, Amazon Aurora automatically handles that for you. So it increases your CPU uh, performance for that database, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd just like to add in a little note here. So, if you wanted to use Aurora for your project, if you wanted to just uh, do some sort of demo or a small little project, then you set up all the infrastructure on AWS uh, using the console or the uh, command line interface. Uh, once you set it up, you actually do need a, a, an accompanying tool in order to be able to access the database within the service. So uh, when I worked on it in the past, I actually got a PostgreSQL client on my computer, and then I was able to connect it to the endpoint that the AWS Aurora service provides. And once you connect your local client to the AWS endpoint, then you can uh, start accessing uh, the data and uh, you will have the performance benefits that the service provides. Yeah. So uh, in, like, for example, there's a project that we did where we connected Amazon Aurora to like this machine learning thing that can like kind of 
detect certain things about the data within Aurora. Um, you would you downloaded a po PostgreSQL client, which is like a front-facing interface where you write like queries, and then that connects to the database in Aurora and Amazon. So it's like a it's like a link from you to the database. It bridges the gap. So all right. And then DynamoDB. So this is a NoSQL database and it's a document style database. So what does that mean? Well, it's really effective for uh, non-relational situations. Uh, it's Remember uh, documents are a big part of uh, non-relational uh, structure and architecture. So DynamoDB is the equivalent of uh, a, re a relational database but in the non-relational sense. So this is like Amazon's version of a non-relational database. And DynamoDB is actually commonly used throughout the industry. Uh, it scales as well. So a lot, if you have a lot of access or like a lot of transactions happening on your data, it'll distribute those transactions to different servers. And then for example, if you have like a PUBG server and there's like a lot of things going on within uh, PUBG's for those of you who don't know, it's like a game that you can play on PC. It's like, a, what do you call them? Battle Royale games. But uh, if you have a lot of things going on, like you have player deaths, player kill count, all those things, you want to store that uh, because they're not necessarily connected to each other. You can store that in like DynamoDB and you can get very quick read and write access because of DynamoDB's uh, connection to edge locations and um, availability zones. So yeah, that's one benefit of DynamoDB. It's just Amazon's equivalent of a non-relational database. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, right? Um, it, it's a it's a relationship, but it's not one that we necessarily need to keep track of. So we only want to keep track of a kill count, but like in usually in like leaderboards and stuff, we only keep track of the kill count. You don't really keep track of who you necessarily queue like you don't need to store that information so if that makes sense so like on the leaderboard for example if you're using a database to kind of uh, pull information from a database onto the leaderboard uh, you don't need necessarily the information about who you killed you just need the information about how many people you killed and that's not um, a relation per se but yes you can uh, definitely that's a good point that, that's a good point that I wanted to point out um, you can have relational data within non-relational databases, but non-relational databases don't necessarily need to perform relational operations on those data. On those data. So yeah, good, good uh, observation. Any more questions? All righty. Next, we have document DB. So. And this is a non-relational database that's really effective for actual documents. So what I mean by that is like, um, like you have journal entries or you have like a lot of birth certificates or a lot of paper that you want to store digitally. This is a example of when you would use document uh, database. So it's fully managed and serviceless, serverless, and it supports MongoDB, which is like another competitor in the document uh, database space. So you would use this when you want to store, for example, research journal websites or papers. Uh, when you want to store research papers on a journal website, uh, document DB is a great way to do that. And you can access and input as you wish. Yes, good question. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, documents can range from JSON to physical text to encoded data, all the way to media files, pictures, things like that. So good point. Um, Do document DB actually handles a lot of different types of data. And yeah, it's not only used for documents themselves. Next is a service called Elasticash. This is not a relational database service or a database service at all. This is something called an in-memory data store. So 
if you don't know what Redis or Memcached is, uh, let me give you a kind of like a brief background. So these are two services that uh, store data that you don't necessarily need for a long time. And you just want to have access for, for a little bit and you need like very quick access. So it, it, you can think of it as like little cache services. Um, Elasticache is a way to create those instances where you need to cache. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're running a Twitch like application and like someone's streaming and then there's a lot of people, a lot of viewers typing into the chat. They're like typing emotes, comments, things like that. You wanna store that information. Uh, once they type it, they store that information into the database. So like all those individual comments, they are stored into the database, but not in the database itself, it's stored into the data store. So like, you don't necessarily wanna keep track of every single comment or anything like that. You only want to, have it be readily available for when you want to pull it out instantly. So like, let's say a user typed in an emote, it would be sent to this cache, not the database. And then you can access the cache to pull that emote out and translate it to have every single viewer see it. So Elastic Cache is the service that allows you to create these caches. And then Redis and Memcached are the caches themselves. And you can think of a data store as just like a database that you don't necessarily need for a long time. Ephemer ephemeral database. Yeah, I'm trying to work on my vocab, but there you go. Alrighty, and then Elasticache, we're gonna move on to Neptune. So this is a fully managed and serverless graph database. Oh, we have a question, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, good question. So how is data, the question was, how is data retrieved more quickly when it's stored in the uh, memory versus the actual database itself? So yeah, so caching is a concept that uh, allows optimization for these certain situations when you need instant response or instant access to a certain amount of data. Uh, it's like used in search history, or I mean, when you're typing in searches and things like that, a lot of caching goes on. So in, the, in this case, if you wanted to access data and you're wondering why it would be easier to access the cache, it's because the cache is storing the data outside of the actual database itself. And when you're performing operations on the database itself, it's very cost heavy. And you're taking the time and computational power to input something and pull it out. But when you store it in a cache, there's, not as much computation going on there. It's, you can think of a cache like a, like a plate and you put things on the plate and then the database itself is like a whole like gallon bucket where you have to reach down and grab stuff from the bucket. So a cache is like keeping temporary data that you can just grab off the plate versus reaching all the way down. So that's a good analogy if you want to think about it that way. Yeah, good question. So in this case, for this example, why do you want to keep track of a Twitch chat? So um, you have this chat feature in Twitch. If you have an application like it, a uh, user types in like an emote or something, that emote, you don't want to store it, right? Like you said, we don't want to keep track of that. We don't want to store it in the database itself. So an effective way to do that is just to store it in a Redis or a memcached instance. So like you just store it on this plate and then get that plate stuff instantly back without having to put it in like a permanent storage. So um, when you send a text or an emote, it gets put onto the cache and then it gets pulled from the cache to be displayed to everybody who can see your emote. So it's like from you to plate and then plate to everybody. If you wanna think about it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. So yeah, instant access, you don't, it's like the useless information that you don't really need for a long time. You put it in caches or you put it in Redis or Memcache instances. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I can kind of jump in here as well. 
the basic idea behind saying, uh, you know, why Twitch chat or uh, emotes in general is a good example here is because um, in a Twitch chat, when uh, someone's live streaming, you're not going to try and keep a record of the entire um, chat history, right? You're just going to keep it temporarily so that any users who are seeing the chat can uh, see it getting updated live, but no one's going to go back to it to look at that data. So since this data is very short term and uh, no one really cares if the data is lost, the Elastic Cache service would be a good choice for this sort of application where the data is short term. Um, you need really good performance because the chat needs to keep updating uh, very quickly, especially when there's a lot of viewers who are typing constantly. So uh, for those reasons, you want to use Elastic Cache to make the experience fast but also you don't need to store the data. Cool, hopefully that clarifies. And another question? Uh, yeah, uh, the question was, in terms of hardware, is the cache stored in RAM? So cache is definitely a part of the RAM. Uh, if you guys take CS61C, the machine structures class, you will cover this in a lot more detail. But the basic summary is uh, when you're thinking about how memory is organized within a computer, uh, you sort of need to think of it as a pyramid. And caches are kind of the structure that goes on the very top of the pyramid uh, in the sense that they don't hold that much information. The amount of memory that is uh, partitioned for a cache is uh, pretty small. Um, but what the cache essentially does is it stores the most relevant information for a user um, w when they're working within a specific context. And uh, the cache is able to do very fast read and uh, write operations for some specific information that you're working on. So uh, let's say, for example, you're working on Google, uh, you're working uh, within Drive, for example, and um, you want to consider what the cache looks like for Drive. Um, the, the Drive cache is going to store uh, stuff like, you know, what are some of the recent files that you worked on? And uh, what are some of the recent users that you worked with and things like that? So that uh, when you want to, uh, for example, create a new file or you want to uh, share your file with um, some users, then it's going to pull in uh, information that you are working with constantly. Or if you're working on your computer and let's say you're working on a specific app, like um, maybe a text editor, then the cache for that text editor is going to contain information like, you know, what are some of the recent files that you worked on within the text editor? And, um, you know, stuff like, uh, you know, what did you recently copy to your clipboard? Uh, stuff like that gets stored in the cache so that you can quickly access it. But then, you know, whenever you change uh, the context that you're working in, uh, your cache is uh, going to need to uh, update. And the way the cache does that is it flushes out all the information that isn't getting used anymore. And uh, then it just starts new. So the cache just, acts as a very small, uh, rapid storage unit for you. And as you go further down into the pyramid of memory, uh, you have your um, RAM, and then you have your actual disk storage, your SSD or your H HDD drive, you know, whatever it is. So that's how memory is kind of set up. It's set up in a pyramid. And the the problem it solves is just the idea of not taking so long to do something or getting information. That's why caches were created in the first place. So yeah, thank you for the 
input, uh, Katlin. But uh, moving on, getting back to Elastic Cache and moving on to Neptune. So going back to Neptune, it's a serverless graph database. So what does that mean? What is a graph? So when we think about relational databases, right? When I said we can have connection to this table, to this table, to this table, uh, a graph is like that on steroids. So like, for example, if you have Facebook, right? You have so many different friends on Facebook or on LinkedIn, and you have different connections to different people where they're working at, um, who they're following, who they've liked. Those are a lot of different connections between different tables in that uh, Facebook or LinkedIn database. This is why we use graph databases to handle those situations. So it's fast and reliable and handles highly connected database uh, and database sets. So social media, for example, you have a person that is friends with someone else and that person posted a photo and then this person liked their photo. Now you have a connection between those three different things but they're not related, but they need to be related in some way. So that's why graphs are used. Uh, one example of why serverless graph databases are so useful is advertisement, right? So when you make a connection or when you're like on Facebook and you like search something up on Facebook and then it yields a result or like you're on like a marketplace, right? You search something in, uh, it makes a connection to what you're interested in. That's a graph or another graph edge. It sees what you're interested in. And then there's analytic tools that the company has to see what connections are made in your graph. And then it actually displays personalized ads for what you just searched. It, that's why when you're like, why is this ad on Instagram showing something that I was just talking about like 20 minutes ago with my friends or like, um, like I searched like a while ago. Well, that's one way in which graph databases are effective is that you can perform a lot of analytics and uh, get really cool or cool versus um, kind of unethical, depending on where you stand, uh, features based on that. So one, uh, one application of graph database and Neptune is AWS's graph database service. So this is just to kind of contextualize things and let you see. So Oracle, like I mentioned, was a leading industry standard. And then we have MySQL. And then right here we have Elasticsearch, which is a database or is a service we didn't cover. And then we have, see, we have DynamoDB right here. DynamoDB is uh, starting to get on its rise as a bit of a more nicer, um, non-relational database, and then it's still outperforming Microsoft Azure. And we like that because that's what we're not learning in this class. So let's go. Nice. All right, quick quiz, just to jump through things. I think we're running pretty close on time. So to migrate an on-premises Oracle database to the cloud, uh, if you remember, Oracle database is a SQL database and what handles SQL databases? RDS. So, uh, Spoilers. So yeah, RDS would be the answer to the first one. To migrate an on-premises PostgreSQL database to the cloud, PostgreSQL is a relational database. Uh, Amazon Aurora can handle that, or the relational database service itself can handle that. So that's the answer for number two. Number three, you have to alleviate database load for data that is accessed often. So you want to be able to access something off the plate and get it fast, that's Elastic Cache. Number four, large sets of user data, profiles, interactions, we just talked about that, that's Neptune. Number five, database fast enough to handle millions of requests per second. I actually forgot this one. DynamoDB, right, 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 excuse me. DynamoDB, because it's a non-relational database, you can access it very quickly due to the non-relational aspect of the data. And then operate MongoDB workloads at scale. MongoDB is a document style database, non-relational database. Another one that we have to counterpart that as a competitor is document DB. So there you have the answers. And then we have a quick break before Kathan gets into a demo and then we'll start to wrap things up after that. So we'll take a quick five minutes in 
we'll be here to answer any questions if you guys have. A lot of content and uh, thank you guys for being patient and asking really good questions. I'm also learning alongside you guys, but we'll take a quick five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's where I was confused at first when I learned this. Aurora is an engine and it's a database itself. So engine is like something that uh, runs a database. Um, but regardless, uh, yes, Aurora is a thing that you can create within RDS. So it can be created alongside MySQL or Oracle or like other those things. So yeah, Aurora is just like a faster relational database that Amazon created. And then RDS is a way you can manage and run commands and do all those things on those instances. And RDS allows you to actually handle multiple databases all at once. So you can have a whole set of different databases all within RDS. Yeah. Uh, is everyone back now or should I wait? Uh, we have two minutes left, but are you guys okay if we uh, just kind of go through the demo real quick? Everybody good? Okay, yeah. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Katha. All right. Awesome. And you? I'm going to share my screen, yes. Cool. All right, awesome. Uh, I'm going to be switching back and forth uh, between this AWS page and my actual AWS console because, uh -oh. you know, how you can, are you guys able to see my screen first? It says, it says you start a screen sharing, but there's nothing on it. Oh, uh, um. <laughs> Uh, oh, did he just, okay, never mind. Yeah, sharing my screen for some reason just um, makes Zoom crash. Not sure why, but um, we'll, we'll take it. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, basically I kind of wanted to show you guys 
how AWS has a bunch of great tutorials if you are interested in exploring any services. And uh, this is just one of those um, tutorials. This tutorial, it actually exposes you to, I believe, three different services, which is uh, pretty great. But what we're going to focus on specifically uh, is DynamoDB. It's covered under the AWS uh, free tier. Uh, there won't be any cost to you to do this tutorial, but if you did want to do the full tutorial, then uh, you would also be looking at uh, things like Amplify, which is used to make websites and uh, API Gateway, um, which again, kind of ties into the website that uh, you're supposed to make in this tutorial. But I'm going to focus specifically on DynamoDB and Lambda. The Lambda function will be handling some of the data and uh, DynamoDB will be storing the data. And uh, you guys will get a look at that in a second. So uh, here's some of the steps that uh, you need to follow. You can choose whichever language you want. I'm comfortable with Python, so I'm just going to continue with Python, and uh, I'm just going to quickly sign in to my AWS console. As you can see, it's asking me to log back in. All right, great. I'm in. Uh, now I can click on Lambda. Uh, make sure to create your function in the same region in which you created the web app. Uh, we're going to ignore the web app aspect of the tutorial for now. We can just go ahead and create function. So just click on this create function button. Under function name, uh, we can say hello world function. I'm going to call it the hello cloud function. Ooh. And you can choose the runtime that you're comfortable with. I'm pretty okay with Python, so I'm gonna choose that one. And then you can click on the create function. Uh, my system is x86, so that should be fine. And it's gonna take um, like a few seconds for setting up all the infrastructure, but we, we should get a successfully created message. Um, as you can see, the message is there. So it, it got created successfully. Under code source, we can replace the code uh, with the code that they've provided. So I didn't even have to do a lot of thinking in terms of the code. I'm just going to go ahead and copy it and I can kind of explain what's going on as well. So just going to replace this with that. Okay, uh, as you can see, there's like a lot of comments going on as well. Um, but basically the Lambda handler function is like kind of the main function that gets called by the Lambda service and it takes two parameters, right? It takes the event parameter and the context uh, parameter. The context is uh, something, uh, some information that might be useful for you while you're processing some request and uh, executing the body of your function. Uh, the event is uh, specific inputs that are being handed to you as a part of the event that called the function. So, um, the way Lambda works is this function will get triggered every time some event happens and that event gets passed in as a parameter to the function. And the event is going to be a um, sort of a JavaScript type uh, object where it has a bunch of key value pairs. And right here, what we're doing is we're accessing the first name key from the event and the last name key from the event. And we're extracting those values. We're putting them together in a string called name. And then uh, we return a JSON object, uh, which is going to get dumped into DynamoDB. 
uh, status code 200 is just the HTML code that signifies that um, our method was executed properly. And then uh, the body of this object is um, you know, json.dumps hello from lambda name. So uh, that's what we're doing for now. Uh, we can go to the file menu and select save to save the changes. Save. And then uh, choose deploy. We deploy the changes. And then um, let's test our new function with the orange test button. Uh, do I have to configure? Yep, I do have to configure. Hello, cloud test event. That's what I'm going to call it. Also, I might be going fast, but uh, hopefully you guys are able to see everything that I'm doing. And then we're just gonna copy this uh, test object. So as you can see, this is a JSON object that I was talking about um, within, the, within the function. It's going to get passed as the event parameter. Um, I'm just gonna replace this with my own name. So it makes sense to me. And then I'm gonna save it. Uh, did it get, I think it did get saved, yep. Okay, now we're gonna test it. And then select the test tab. We're going to, okay. So we're going to test it. And you can see that we got the response that we expected. We got the status code 200 and the body of our response says, hello from Lambda, Katan Gandhi, um, using the event parameter that I passed in with this testing object. So that's a good introduction to Lambda if you haven't seen Lambda before. And now let's look into how to create the DynamoDB table. So we're going to go to DynamoDB. Let me get out of here. Okay, I'm just gonna search for it. But hopefully you guys can see that, you know, it's pretty easy to follow along with uh, some of these, uh, tutorials. It's pretty step-by-step -step and uh, very instructional. Uh, let's go to the dashboard. Okay, create table. We're going to create table, table name, hello cloud database. Um, in the partition key field, enter ID. The partition key is part of the table's primary key. And you guys learned about primary key today. So look at that. All your information that we're presenting is already coming in handy. Hey. So ID string, uh, that looks good. Leave the rest of the default values and changed and choose the create table button. So I'm just gonna scroll down, click create table. Uh, it's gonna take a few seconds to have it ready. Okay, it is active now. Uh, I'm gonna select this and what does it say? In the general information section, show additional info by selecting the down arrow. Hmm. Um, Copy the ARN, okay. I just need to find the ARN somewhere. And to remind you, an ARN is like 
the unique identifier for the instance of the service you created. So it's like the code or like the UID of something. And that's what you use to like reference other instances or objects in AWS, but yeah, ARN. Yeah, so I found it down here in case you guys missed it and I copied it. Um, let's edit our Lambda function to be able to write data to it in a new browser window, okay? I'm gonna have to multitask now, uh, kind of cool, I guess. Go back to Lambda. I need to click on this function. Select the configuration tab and select. Okay. Configuration permissions. Uh, under role name, choose the link. A new browser tab will open. So uh, this is part of the IAM lecture that we talked about, um, how a lot of these services, they take on temporary roles in order to use other services. So currently that's what we're doing. We're looking at one of these roles. Um, it's taking some time, okay. We have it now. Um, in the permission policies, open the add permission. Um, add add permissions, yes. And which type of create inline policy? Okay, that's fine. Create inline policy. Um, select the JSON tab, go back here, JSON tab, yeah, and, and then paste this. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, remember that you can, instead of going through and clicking down drop boxes, when you're creating permissions, you can just do a JSON, uh, upload right here and it'll skip all the other, uh, unnecessary, um, time you need to like select. So yeah. JSON is an alternative. Okay, I'm just gonna copy the ARN for my Dynamo DB table here and then paste it here. So now uh, this policy has access to this specific Dynamo DB table. And these are all the actions that it can uh, do within Dynamo DB. It can put an item, delete an item, get an item, uh, scan the table, a query for something or update a specific item, which I think covers um, most of the things that you can do in DynamoDB. So uh, this looks good. And then what am I supposed to do? Choose the blue review policy and then enter um, hello. Okay, that, that is not a problem. And click review policy. Name it hello. What is it? Hello cloud dynamo policy. And I would recommend that you guys try out on your own time after lecture. Maybe it's as you can see, it's pretty easy to follow. Um, it, this is more fun for me right now than it is for you guys. I imagine. Um, so if you want to share the fun, should definitely try it. Okay, I've created the policy. You may now close this browser tab. I'll keep it open for now. Okay. Ooh, breaking the rules. <laughs> okay, now modify the Lambda function to write to the DynamoDB table. So this is where it gets interesting. And I'll explain what the code is doing also so that you guys aren't completely lost. Um, okay, so just gonna copy this whole thing. Whoops, copied a bit too much. Okay. 
can that should do. Uh, go back to the code section. Look at my function. Replace it. Okay, so let's uh, consider some of these imports that we're doing. We have uh, import JSON, just a package to help us handle uh, JSON objects. Then we're importing Boto3. Uh, this is the Python uh, SDK, Software Development Kit uh, for AWS. So any service that we want to use that's within AWS, um, we can access through this uh, SDK, which um, in our case is a Python package called Boto3. Uh, and then we're also importing some Python packages, I believe. Um, we're importing GM time and STRF time. Um, I don't think the time part is too useful for us. Uh, we could probably even get rid of all of that, but um, for now, I'm just going to keep it. Okay, so we're creating a DynamoDB object using the AWS SDK. Uh, need to change the name here. It's a Hello Cloud database. Okay, so um, we're accessing the DynamoDB service and then within the DynamoDB service, uh, there's a, a few methods and uh, constructors and things like that. So uh, we're representing our Hello Cloud database table as an object called table within Python. And uh, we're also storing the current time in a human readable format. Uh, this is like, um, like a regex string and the GM time seems to be a function that you can just call and also pass to another function called strf time from the time package so that constitutes our variable now it's just a a string i believe for the current time and then we're we have our main lambda function the lambda handler it's taking our name from the event parameter uh, which is again a JSON object with uh, two key value pairs: first name and then my name. Katan is the value, and last name, and Gandhi, which is my last name, would be the value for this key. And then we're saying response equals table dot put item. So if you remember from the lambda policy that we were looking at. Uh, we had the put item um, action. We specifically have access to it right here, put item. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Without, without this action um, permission, we wouldn't be able to call this method successfully. So pretty important to notice that. And then we're going to put in an item, which is just a way to represent a specific record within DynamoDB. Uh, remember, DynamoDB is a NoSQL database, non-relational. So we're inputting items, not records. And we are inputting ID uh, with name, the variable up here, and then latest greeting time. Uh, which would be the time when uh, the function is run. And then we return a properly formatted JSON object um, as a response, an HTML response with the code 200, which means it works. And uh, just for like debugging purposes, uh, to, to check our uh, console logs, we're going to say hello from Lambda with my name. So that pretty much covers this uh, function completely. If you have questions, uh, we could answer them. But uh, that pretty much covers what this code is doing. OK, so then I can choose the Deploy button at the top of the code editor. So going back here, let's deploy these changes. I'll also save them just to be safe. Okay. 
looks good. Now we're going to test the changes. Choose the, oops, choose the orange test button. You should see an execution result succeeded with the green background. Open the DynamoDB console and um, we, we can explore items and what's getting saved, okay? So I'm gonna click this test. Um, status code 200 means the method worked successfully. There were no problems. Uh, and now the, the grand reveal, gotta go to the DynamoDB console tables um well explore items interesting i don't okay there it is explore items and voila <laughs> the database has my item with my name and the greeting time right. uh as you can see well not sure why. Oh, okay. It's saying it's seventh October in the um, I think in the GMT the Greenwich Mean Time the the standard time that the world like follows. Okay. As you can see, it's the plus zero zero. So the main reference point for all time zones and. Us specifically, we're in the Pacific Pacific time zone, uh, which would be minus minus seven or something. I'm not completely sure, but uh, that's why this looks weird. You know, why is it saying Friday? It's because of the GMT. But yeah, that pretty much concludes the demo. So. I hope you guys found that interesting. And uh, do you guys have any questions related to the code here? All right, if not, then I'm gonna hand it back to Bowen and maybe he could quickly wrap us up with the content left. Okay, thank you, Katham. Uh, yeah, you'll be here to answer questions to clarify on the demo more. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll probably cover the, it's just a little bit, not too complex, but I'll cover that in the next lecture at the beginning. Um, but for the meantime, since you guys are all here, uh, we'll just do the attendance code for, day, for today, and then um, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you all for showing up, and uh, thanks, Katan, for the demo, helping me out, and uh, what else? Yeah, remember, Quiz 5 is released tonight at 12 a.m., or slash tomorrow at 12 a.m. So uh, that will be due next Thursday before lecture. But thank you all for showing up. And uh, yeah, we're gonna probably release labs that are kind of similar to the demo you saw where you have like a list of instructions to follow and then we'll have you uh, share proof that you did the lab, but um, more to come, we'll keep you guys updated, but. Thanks for being participatory. And if that's it, then you are all welcome to leave.